I now recognize myself for five minutes. This question is for all the witnesses. What does it take for a small carrier to develop broadband in isolated areas such as American Samoa, Puerto Rico, the various islands of the Marianas, or some of the most remote parts of Alaska? These are places that you can't drive to, you have to take a boat or fly to. Well, Chairman, one thing that uh, is important in serving remote areas like Alaska, um, like, like uh, your home district, is, is making sure that you have certainty around these timelines when you need to use helicopters and boats and, and other mechanisms that you don't need to, to use to deploy services in, in places like Washington, D.C. You need to be able to schedule that ahead of time. Um, this has really been seen with some of the recent natural disasters in several areas, including American Samoa, about how certainty about what you can do and when you can bring equipment in needs to be lined up with the permitting process and streamline that, especially as you're looking to expand coverage or restore service where it's been out so that you can actually provide service in some of these very remote areas where it's already very high cost to serve. Ms. Fitzgerald? I agree with that. I also think that, you know, we talked about the business case here, and in some of these very remote, very rural places, you know, you lack subscribers. There's not enough subscribers to make the business case. And so in that case, universal service is critical. Um, you know, adequate and uh, reliable universal service support is what makes or breaks those networks. Mr. Carliner? Uh, I, I certainly agree with that. And I think That for a solution for an island, for example, is going to require a really comprehensive planning and bringing the stakeholders together. It's going to be a mix of technologies, a mix of areas and communities. And I'd say the most important thing from our experience is to make sure that the engineering and the technology matches with the business plan. They have to go together. And it's important that they fit together to make it affordable, to make it both sustainable as well as affordable for the community. So proper planning and bringing the elements together, technology and business and the stakeholders together is, is I think, the most important first step. Mr. Owens. Thank you. I would add um, that, again, uh, sufficiency and predictability and universal service is by far one of the biggest issues um, because those dollars are actually used to build networks. Uh, and without the underlying infrastructure in place, you're not going to get some of the other technologies that you would use to complement the services that you're bringing uh, to, to very rural and remote areas. Ms. Fitzgerald, can you discuss what geographic area size might be attractive to small and regional providers as they compete for spectrum at auction and provide some background on why the FCC may have chosen not to employ smaller geographic area licenses in past spectrum auctions? Sure. Uh, in terms of spectrum auctions, geographic license size is always uh, a point of contention, usually between large nationwide carriers and small rural providers. Um, RWA has uh, largely supported uh, an area called a cellular market area, or a CMA, uh, which is a subdivision. They, they go as large as nationwide, and they go as small as census tracts. So we tend to favor uh, sizes around the CMA area. Um, there are, I believe, a little over 700 of those nationwide. Um, we have also supported, uh, for instance, in the uh, current uh, CBRS proceeding, support county size or census tract license sizes. And generally, you know, if, if, if I'm a small carrier, I have a maybe a two or three county service area. First of all, I can't afford a nationwide license. I can't even afford, you know, licenses significantly smaller than nationwide. I want a license size. Uh, that I can afford, that I'm going to be able to utilize to provide support to these service areas, and and a, and a license size that I can afford to build out. Obviously, there are build out requirements tied to licenses won at auction. So, if you win one of those licenses, you need to be able to build it out. If I'm a nationwide carrier, you know, smaller licenses mean more administrative minutia, um, and so uh, it also means you have to compete in more markets to win licenses to cover the territory you want to cover. So we support smaller license sizes because it uh, increases the number of bidders in an auction, um, and it doesn't depress auction turnout. Thank you. I'm running out of time here. So Mr. Donovan, What's your current view of the FCC's approach to mitigating overstated coverage areas on the broadband map? And can you elaborate on the disproportionate impact this might have on small carriers? Sure. Thank you for the question. So uh, 
The, the map that's out right now for the initial eligible areas for Mobility Fund 2 was supposed to have a better starting point, looking more like coverage on the ground. I think uh, if, if you looked at the map, um, you'd be surprised, Dr. Marshall, that most of the big first has coverage of 4, megabit, of 4 GLTE um, across just about the entire <laughs> district, or um, Rank Member Schneider that in St. Elizabeth is served and you have to drive hundreds of miles to find a dead spot based on this initial areas. Uh, the problem there is that if these areas are not challenged by a small carrier that wants to seek support in this area, and that means go buy a phone, go buy a plan, drive test it, submit that data to the FCC for the chance to participate in an auction, um, which is costly in itself, then these areas we're going to keep going on marked as served and support will not be eligible for them. Thank you.